Hello listeners, Namina here. Welcome to the Dr. GPCR podcast. Before we jump into this new episode, we have exciting news to share with you. The new Dr. GPCR ecosystem platform is almost ready for launch. What is it about, you ask? Well, think about a place where GPCR scientists, trainees, and GPCR organizations can thrive and where it's all about science and GPCRs. Access is restricted to members of the field, and each sign-up will be approved accordingly. Once your sign-up is approved, you'll be able to enter the ecosystem and interact with GPCR colleagues like never before. You can still sign up to be an ecosystem beta tester. We are going to open the ecosystem slowly to ensure that you get the best experience. Please keep in mind that the Dr. GPCR ecosystem is a unique place, a first and one of a kind, where we want to make sure that you get the best experience out of this new world. Visit drgpcr.com ecosystem to start your GPCR journey. Also, make sure that you mark your calendar for the third edition of the Dr. GPCR Summit. This year, the summit will be held between October 10th and 16th. Stay tuned as we are working on the program for the summit. Visit drgpcr.com to find out about all our activities. And now, let's dive into this episode. Hello, everyone. This is Yamina from Dr. GPCR, and I'm delighted this morning to have with me Dr. Graham Latz. Hi, Graham. Hi. Good to be so here. Excited. So excited to have you. We were before pressing record, we were just talking about how beautiful the sun is shining behind you. You seem to have a very beautiful backyard there. Well, um, yes, we've been here about six and a half years. It's been it's lovely living here. Um and it's nice when the sun's in here. I'm actually in my conservatory. Um, but in about half an hour or so, I suspect the sun will disappear around the, the side and then it will start to get quite cold in here. But there we are. At the minute, it's nice. And nice. At the minute, it's really beautiful. Yeah. And the sun is just coming up here in, in Boston. But um, we, we love the sun. That, that's yeah. always a great, uh, a great way to start the day. So let's, let's dive right into it. Um, please tell us who you are and how did you get into the GPCR field? Yeah, so um, currently I'm a a professor in receptive pharmacology in the Department of Pharmacology at the University of Cambridge. Um, I was actually born around this area, so it's been nice. Uh, my career's taken me to different places, but it's been nice to come back to, to the Cambridge area. I, I really like living in here. Um, and for those people who are not aware of the, the Cambridge system, um, it's a collegiate university. So beyond just our role in in the department, I'm also a fellow of uh, one of the colleges, which is called St. John's College, and, and that's one of the, the colleges that was, uh, it was, it was originally um, produced or well, founded in 1509. So um, that's a lot longer, a lot older than most US countries or Australia and places yeah. like that. Um, and luckily, a couple of years ago, I was also elected to a fellowship in the, the British Pharmacology Society. So that's been a, a real honor for me. Um, so, wow. so that's who I am. That's who I am. So, so what was your other question? Sorry, I forgot. Yeah, the, the next question was, how did you get into the GPCR field? But but before we, we go to that, 50, in the 1500s, I, yeah. I think yeah. it's just fantastic. And as a professor of pharmacology and a fellow, um, do you also teach? Yeah, well, luckily this year, no, because I'm actually on a research sabbatical. So after six years um, at Cambridge, if you do your teaching, then yes, you, uh, you're you entitled to a, a research sabbatical. So that's been quite nice. But normally, yes, I teach uh, I teach um, pharmacology, obviously, because uh, uh, the Cambridge degree system is called a tripos and um, they do natural sciences. And in the second year, they can specialize in pharmacology. Um, so my lectures are drug receptor interactions, as you probably would imagine um, and we also have a, a medical course um, and there we teach on the second year which is uh, called med uh, mechanisms of drug action basically a, a posh way of saying pharmacology so um so yes yeah, so so again i teach drug receptor interactions on that course as well and then as part of the college then uh, we provide our own individual tutorials i guess people would call that or supervisions we actually call it so you actually have a small group of students like four or five students a maximum mm -hmm. And actually, in addition to the departmental teaching, you teach them in those supervisions as well. And that's really quite rewarding because you can actually, over a period of time, get to really know these students and, and expand on what's just simply taught in the course um, beyond that. And you can develop that. 
the one thing it does teach you is um before I got here on my, my knowledge of pharmacokinetics and things like that might not have been quite as much as it should have been. So I've learned a lot of the different aspects of pharmacology just beyond GPCRs and things such as that in the course. And, and, and that's been really, really, really rewarding. And of course, being Cambridge, you have some highly intelligent students there, which equally keeps you on your toes and makes sure you're fully aware of what's going on because <laughs> you don't want to get it wrong in a, in a supervision. So yeah, it's, it's really, really good fun. Actually. That's fine. And that's, that's actually so, sounds like a really fun experience being have being able to teach, I guess, in this in a larger setting of students and really having that that those small little small groups. And and those students in those small groups, uh, are they studying to be pharmacologists or are they med students? But both. So um so the college so there are 31 colleges at Cambridge and, and they sort of distribute we we have a, a fixed cap on the number of medical students we can take um, from the government. Um, and there's a, so those medical students are split across the colleges and then individual colleges teach the, the tutorial section um, in however they want to do it. So, so I normally teach the medical students um, pharmacology, mo mechanisms of drug action, but then we also teach, if we have any students who choose the, the undergraduate tripos in, in pharmacology module, if, if they take that, then we supervise those as well for but i only supervise really for st john's college occasionally i'll supervise it for a couple of the other college associations such as queen's college um but predominantly i just do it for st john's um and that's quite interesting because you're lecturing to 380 medical vet students and then you're just interacting with four or five of them um so yeah it, it, obviously that that's what used to happen the past couple of years have been a bit more on zoom but um but yeah, yeah so it really is a, a a really interesting dynamic and a different way of teaching and it's it's really quite good fun i love it is it is it specific to the uk this system it's specific really to the oxford and cambridge um but i think there are other places so my former institute which is the university of warwick they didn't do anything like that that they don't have the college system so it's really cambridge and oxford that um uh, there are other universities that have colleges but Predominantly, Cambridge and Oxford have these, this collegiate system where you're associated with a college and then you are taught within that college as well. Not everybody who takes up a, a, a faculty position, if you want to call it that, ends up in a college. It's entirely up to you. Um, mm -hmm. I took the decision I would give it a, a, a go just to see what it was like because I wasn't educated at Cambridge in the, in the first place. And, and um, you know, it's very nice to go to black tie dinners and, and things such as that. I, I didn't own a bow tie before I got to Cambridge or cufflinks or anything like that. So it's <laughs> quite funny to, to to attend these dinners when we used to attend these dinners. Um, hopefully, coming forward with the pandemic, we'll we'll be back to be able to attend them again. And, and you get to interact with so many um, fellows. So people tend to remain in their college for most of for, for all of their life. So you get to meet with really interesting other academics in other subjects during that period as well that's fantastic and before uh, joining the, the taking the position that you have today let's go back to the beginning Graham at 15 or 10 uh, did you did you always like science it's interesting um, I don't know if we're supposed to say but I, I looked down the, the questions yeah. that you had for me um, and yes. one of them was um, the, about the aha moments what, what are your yes. aha moments and um, and I was really struggling because I think I don't know if I've had any <laughs> aha moments. Um, but actually, one of my first aha moments was actually uh, when I was at school. Um, so I come from a very small town called March, which is just north of, of Cambridge. Um, and, and it is spelled March like the month. Um, and it's a Fenland town. So it's it's not very, um, it's not got very much money or, or stuff like that. Um, so I'm the first person in my uh, family ever to go to university. Um, and when I was studying there, the thing I was pretty good at when I studied was science. Um, and I had a chemistry teacher at that school, which was just a, a what we call a comprehensive school in the UK. So it wasn't funded in any way, shape or form. It was just a school that everybody goes to. Um, and he, his name was Dr. Telford and he had a doctor. And I always thought, well, why have you got a doctor in front of your name where everybody else hasn't? Um, my parents and, and grandparents and that, and my dad was an accountant. Um, my mom worked in the same office. Prior, most of my family worked on in farming and, and things such as that. So I thought, well, what's this doctor? You know, I know what doc, I know what GPs are. Well, what's, why can you be a doctor? And he said, so I went to university, I studied chemistry, um, and eventually I became, did a postdoc. And then um, at that point, I decided I wanted to do teaching. So I was like, so, so you can actually do science as a career? And he was like, yeah. Um, 
And that was my real inspiration for doing it. I thought, well, the only thing I'm ever, ever going to be any good at is science. So my aha moment, if you want to put it that way, was him being a doctor and realizing that I could, I didn't have to be an accountant. I didn't have to work in a bank. I could actually do science and, and go off and study that. So he was my real inspiration um, to, to getting into science um, and specifically in chemistry, I suppose. Um, so after that, I, I worked hard. I did my A-levels um, and then I went to study biochemistry at the University of Birmingham. Um, and the reason for choosing biochemistry, I thought this morning, why did I choose biochemistry? is because I liked chemistry and biology. I will admit I don't like much about plants. Um, I'm not a great gardener either, so my lawn and <laughs> whatever is quite clear. So I was never great so much about the, the, the actual, or animals really. I'm not a great fan of animals and I'm not great at plants, but I actually like biological processes and I liked how chemistry modulated the biological processes. So I went to Birmingham to study the biochemistry. Um, that was at the age of 18. Um, so I moved from a very, very small town, um, population of no more than eight or 9,000 to Birmingham, which is the second largest city in, in the UK. So that was a bit of an education as well. People say, why didn't I go to Cambridge? Um, probably I wasn't. I never even thought about going to Cambridge at the time. Um, whether I would have been good enough or not, I don't know. But I, if I, I made the decision that if I was going to move away, it, I didn't want to just move like 15 miles down the road. I would still be close. I wanted to move away and actually have a, a life over it um, somewhere else um, which upset my parents I'm an only child so that was the end of that for them they felt they got quite upset about it but they could understand my decisions um, so when I was there um, I, I've got to say I actually didn't like my biochemistry degree I wasn't particularly keen on Krebs cycle I wasn't particularly keen on the pentose phosphate pathway it didn't really float my boat that much um, but the final year of the course and, and I tried to switch course a couple of times um, in the final year of the course then there was a whole module around signal transduction and receptors and, and gpcrs and i thought well, this is quite cool um and there was also another module which is about vesicle transport and because if you think about it those two are kind of kind of linked um so that moved me to thinking actually i, I really do quite enjoy this and, and what i actually really quite enjoyed was the fact that there was a lot of stuff we didn't understand and i've always been interested in trying to understand that so so i thought well I was quite good at my degree, um, despite not liking it. So I was approached by one of the academics there, Professor John Davy, at the time to say, well, would you like to do a PhD in my lab? Um, he was more toward the vesicle transport stuff, um, but he got funding from Cancer Research UK to study uh, cell proliferation in the cell cycle, um, which was in a, a thing called a fission yeast. So the fission yeast is called Schizosaccharomyces pombi, um, schizo being different, Saccharomyces as, it, as all yep. yeast are. So it has two different mating types. And what I didn't realize at the time was that the cell cycle and cell regulation in pombi was modulated by pheromones, which bind to GPCRs. Yeah. And therefore, that got me into studying GPCRs and, 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 and peptide GPCRs, and you'll see later on, we'll, we'll cover peptide GPCRs, I suppose. Um, so I did that for my PhD, um, loved every moment of it. Uh, and then he offered me a postdoc position in the, in the lab at the time. And we actually moved them from the University of Birmingham to the University of Warwick, where I spent a, 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 long, a number of years. Um, but I said, if I was going to do that, I wanted to work on something different from signaling at the time. And, and um, what we actually worked on was a uh, peptide um, pro-hormone convertases, you know, the, the things now which cleave a lot of the, the hormone receptor agonists which I work on today. So that was quite good fun. Again, I was using yeast and stuff. And then I achieved a, an independent fellowship, um, which took me back to studying GPCRs. And then over a period of time, we, we've transitioned into different things. We managed to form a spin-out company for a few years at Warwick, uh, which was studying GPCRs in, in yeast and um, human GPCRs. Um, and I guess that's the transition that I've made over time into getting more into to human GPCRs. We spent a bit of time doing some mathematical modeling as well, the, trying to trying to get answers to biological questions that we couldn't couldn't get just by doing that. So got into doing the maths of that. Really enjoyed the challenge of learning how to do computational modeling um, and doing that myself, being a biochemist by training and then moving toward a pharmacologist. Um, and I enjoyed my time at Warwick, but it, it reached a point, perhaps my second aha moment was realizing that actually at, 
But in that institute, I was the only person who was working on what I worked on. There wasn't anyone else in there doing it. And that becomes incredibly lonely. I mean, it's great to interact with other people in, in the local vicinity, David Point and Mark Wheaton, people like that who are still at Birmingham and, and areas around there. But actually not meeting people day to day in the corridor and just talking about it. So I think probably two or three years before we eventually moved, I made a decision that it was time to, to work sticks and move. Um, and then luckily in 2015, an opportunity came to move to the University of Cambridge. And that's where we where we moved in July 2015. Um, I can't say I was particularly popular with the family at the time. They didn't particularly want to move. Um, but the move has been amazing for me. It, 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 it's brought us back to where I like to live. I like to live in the countryside here. With, um, and being in the Department of Pharmacology is, is a fantastic place at Cambridge. So and that really also acted as a point where we sort of drew the line of study using yeast really anymore. And we've now totally focused on agonist bias of, of human GPCRs. So, so that's really how we ended up where we are. Makes me feel very old going through all of that. <laughs> well, still, I think it's, it's a fantastic story. And I love how you, you took one of my last questions. And I think everybody knows by now that I do have this set of questions just to, to guide people. And then you integrated it back from the beginning. So uh, I, th I think it's a fantastic way of, of telling the story. You mentioned that uh, now you, you shifted from working on GPCRs and yeast models. You got interested in, in human GPCRs at some point in your career. And then I do have to ask this because I asked from everybody, what is your favorite GPCR? I've got a list of them written down on the, on the, on the page okay. of paper there. Because um, I, I was like, in my lab yesterday, I go in the state of the pandemic, we're back from working from home, but I go in like twice a week. Um, and I said to them, well, what am I going to say is my favorite GPCR? And, and we're a bit of a diverse lab in that we work on quite a lot of different receptors. Um, so I would guess from my early days, I can't help but be attracted to, to the receptor that I worked on first, which was a receptor called MAM2, which is a, a pheromone peptide receptor and but that makes your other questions hard because it's not really involved in any diseases <laughs> because we don't care about that and, and obviously that brings along with it which I, I, more people will be familiar with i know you've had chris tate and people like that from here yeah. who've looked at the state and stuff like that so they've been long-term favorites of me um we now work on class 80 pcr specifically the adenosine receptors um and we've done a lot of work recently on adenosine receptors so i, I suppose they're up there um but I can't really say that they're my favorites. So I would say overall, I have to revert to what's called the class B1 GPCRs, which are obviously peptide receptors, um, yeah. glucagon receptor, calcitonin receptor, corticotrophin releasing receptor, glucagon like peptide 1 receptor, the gastric inhibitory polypeptide receptor. All of that family are where my heart lies. And it's probably not surprising, really, given my background working on peptide pheromone receptors that moving into human peptide receptors with large peptides at the end um it is where i i, I guess where my heart lies that's what i'm interested in um, and i suppose while they're a small family um the other thing that's really fascinating me and, and through interactions with, with david pointer and, and others um is the role of ramp proteins in that receptor activity modifying proteins and i think that's the thing which is really captured my imagination especially in the last five or six years with those receptors so there are a small group of receptors there's only 15 of them compared to class a but what these ramps do and how these ramps study them is and affect their signaling and their trafficking and things is, is something we were able to do initially look at in yeast and now do it extensively in mammalian systems so so i think we'll go with those ones but i feel a bit <laughs> sorry for, for not saying adenosine receptors because i do like them as well well, that's okay. I mean, I've, I was talking to, to Michel Bouvier, who, who mentioned that he does not have a favorite receptor. He actually, uh, he has, he's interested more in understanding GPCRs in general, and these receptors are great tools to understand GPCRs in general, and specifically diving in through the stories and the function and the signaling of each of these receptors. So any, there is no good or bad answer to that. Just hold on one second. I need to close the curtains because the sun is coming up and it's it was shining yeah. too too bright too bright <laughs> well that's 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 fantastic i love class b gpcrs i've worked very uh, for a short period of time on pthr receptors and i think they're just 
fantastic diving into the literature and reading more about what are the physiological events they control. Yeah. Um, you know, like babies getting their teeth is yeah. is controlled by PTHR1. It's just amazing. Yeah, no, um, and, and that's what I like. And I think also the kinetics and the dynamics of a, a peptide receptor can be really quite different to looking at an adenosine receptor where you've got a small molecule. We, we, we'll cover that in a little bit in detail, I think, in a bit. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And I was, uh, you know, I, and when I think about adenosine, I think about my morning cup of coffee yeah. <laughs> and um, and how, how it's better to delay that first cup of coffee because you're di- displacing the, uh, the ligand with caffeine. Yeah. And if you take it a little bit later, the effect of the caffeine is longer, which I think it's uh, it's nearly impossible for me to wait those two hours after waking up to, to drink it. <laughs> Yeah, no, I don't think I can do that either. <laughs> to, to get my coffee. Every time I take the first sip of my coffee, I'm like, oh, there you go. I just displaced it. I just activated my adenosine receptor with some caffeine. Um, you're doing quite well to even think of that at that time in the morning. So I, I think you're more <laughs> I, worried about getting the kids out the door or whatever. <laughs> I am too. I am too. But I think I just made my peace with, with the fact that we are always going to be running late. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And then we get there when we get there. At the end of the day, what matters is that we got there. <laughs> but um, for, for some I'm reason, I punctual, I'm a very punctual person, so um, I, I don't buy into that kind of approach. Uh, you know, it's difficult. I think it's it's it, it's a change of. I think I gave up on being uh, on being on time, especially with the with the children. And it's it's funny because it's always five or ten minutes after the time that we're supposed to be there and it's it we just cannot beat those five to ten minutes (laughs) yeah no matter what time i wake up there is always a limiting factor and it's typically not me or coffee by the sense of it oh yes definitely not definitely not but coffee is an important part of 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 the morning But interestingly, people uh, for a long time, people ask me, so how many cups of coffees do you drink? And I say, well, maybe one or two. And it's typically watered down with uh, with some almond milk or something. But I did a bachelor's, a master and a PhD without drinking coffee on a regular basis. Wow. Yes. And people just don't understand. And I said, no, I used to have coffee maybe twice a week just because people were inviting me to grab coffee, but it was not something I would drink first thing in the morning. Now I cannot live without it. <laughs> cool. So let's, let's talk a little bit about, uh, about um, class B um, yeah. peptide hormone receptors. I understand the beauty of, of having these peptides and having the, these pre-pro, you know, these peptides need to be cleaved in order to be active and then in order to activate the receptors. But um, what can you tell us? What is the most fascinating thing that you can think of regarding one or any of these receptors? Something that we just discovered we didn't know about. Well, I I think one of the things that's been really cool over the past few years, and and, um, obviously this is the work from Patrick Sexton and and others, is actually getting structures from these receptors. I think when when it first came that we could might be able to see what these receptors were, um, I think that's that's been amazing and, and that's really, really helped in understanding how some of these receptors work. Um, so, so I think that's super cool. Um, of course, I think one of the biggest challenges of working on these receptors is the fact they're peptides um, and that's always going to, to be a limit. And, and yeah, one of the things that you have in one of your questions is what's one of the challenges of working on these receptors? And I did actually put, you know, I can easily afford to buy five kilograms of caffeine to work on an adenosine receptor. But if I try and buy five kilograms of a peptide, GLP-1 or whatever, I don't think the rest of the lab are going to like me very much because they're going to have to pack up doing things. So, so I think trying to, to understand that binding, trying to see how we can use Math, uh, computational in silico docking and things such so those kinds of approaches at, and actually following the trajectories of how these peptides combined into these receptors now I think is is really really cool because it, it opens up the, the avenue for us to understand these receptors better I think um, and of course I guess the other thing which is from my own sort of approach um, you know if we originally look back at some of the, of the older literature class B GPCRs with GS coupled they just do cyclic A and P that's it yeah. Um, 
And luckily that's not the case. There's a lot of different pleiotropic coupling in that as well. And and that's what really has fascinated me for a long time. I find it amazing that we can take, say, two receptors such as GLP-1 and, and the GIP receptor, both of which are expressed in pancreatic beta cells. Both of them will promote insulin secretion. And yet when you go to um, an alpha cell, um, GLP-1 will suppress glucagon secretion, yet it also promotes glucagon secretion. And you think, well, these can't just be the same GS-coupled receptors. Um, there must be other intricacies going on there. And, and that's that's what I think is really fascinating about them and, and trying to understand that. And if you worked on PTH, then, of course, that's multiple different signaling pathways as well. And, and I think it's it, that's where I, my, my interest is really sparked in them. I think they're. I think GPCRs in general, but I think in the context of, of class B GPCRs, it's really fascinating that you take them out of one cellular context, put them in another one, and then the signaling changes. And then it makes you wonder: is it interacting with another protein, like you mentioned, the ramps, or is it because there's other effectors and it just can couple to to other effectors? Yeah, um, EPACs and things such as that as well. I think that's part yeah. of what's going on with the alpha cell and the beta cell thing, as, as I was talking about earlier on. And, and I think that's that's driving my own research group and others into looking into those accessory proteins. I think um, ramps, obviously, will we'll, yeah. we'll keep you on, on ramps, but um, it's not just ramps. It, it's the other components that are there as well. And I think that's what's bringing class B GPCRs and making them really interesting again. And it's funny because you, you said you said accessory proteins, and I think that well, that's what we use as 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 a term, but I don't think they're accessories. They're, no, no <laughs> they're <laughs> exactly. Maybe we should we should think about changing the uh, the way people talk about these these RAM proteins and other interactors as as essentials or modulators that actually are not just accessories. Because I feel like yeah. the word doesn't give them enough credit. No, I, I probably allosteric modulators, I guess, is probably a good word for them, or cellular allosteric modulators, because yeah. I think that's what their, their probable role is. You know, we, we talk a lot about compound allosteric modulators, but actually, you know, ramps are allosteric modulators, all of those kind of, even G proteins, obviously, are allosteric modulators of a GPCR. So, so I think that whole ensemble of, of networks is really quite interesting to, to drill down, and, and especially from my point of view, from class B GPCRs, I think it's fascinating. You mentioned that in the lab you work on different GPCRs, <clears throat> and um, I wanted to ask, what kind of techniques do you typically use? You mentioned computational, you mentioned it's liquid docking. What is the go-to techniques that you that people use in the lab, or if you know anything that you feel like you can share with us? So, um, so my background, I suppose, back in the days when we were working on yeast, was to study individual G protein combinations because the genetics of working on yeast is, is really cool. The Pombi is, itself is a haploid organism, so it's going to go on one copy. So you can knock out the G protein, you can knock out the endogenous receptor, you can then do this where you, you fuse tails of, of human GPCRs, uh, sorry, human G proteins onto the, the yeast G protein and you can express that. So back, back in the day, we were looking at GPCI G protein couplings in yeast. And of course, everyone told me, well, that's working on yeast, isn't it? So it's not real. All right, fair enough, it's not real. So we now move into mammalian systems and what do we look at? Well, we're still very interested in looking at those G protein couplings. So probably unsurprisingly, my, my lab is heavily invested in breadth based techniques now. Um, from the start of looking at the denosine receptors, some of the, the peptide receptors we've talked about, fluorescently binding to those receptors. The actual G protein activation now, you know, there are a range of, you talk with Michelle Bouvier, it's got breath based sensors, Brian Roth with his two part system, we, we use those sorts of things. Uh, rest in recruitment, right? So I think if we don't use the word breath about 700 times a day in my lab, then we, we're talking something wrong. Um, but then we also are interested in a bit further downstream from that, so cytic AMP production, calcium mm -hmm. production, and um, second messengers, ERK activation, and things such as that. So, so I guess we look at the, the receptor level and then downstream to those points. Um, I've just been fortunate enough to obtain a, a Royal Society Industry Fellowship, um, which means as of beginning of March, I'll spend 50% of my time working with, with AstraZeneca um, for four years, which is a really exciting opportunity for me. Um, and one of the things that we want to do there is tap into the CRISPR and the genome editing stuff that those guys do to try to develop primary cell systems where we can express some of these reporters and, and processes as well to try and get a more 
physiological feel on that. But but again, it's still going to be using the kinds of techniques that we've just talked about, which are extensively Brett or Luciferase or, or whatever reporters, I think. My answer, that's fantastic. Yes, and I did see that you got that fellowship and congratulations on that. Okay. I think it even ended up in the in the Dr. GPCR newsletter. Yeah, I I saw it. I like to hunt for news like that because I think it's it's absolutely important to recognize these these milestones. I love the yeah, idea. I yeah, no, um, the, it, it's good. been going to be really. I'm really looking forward to actually seeing what it's like being the other side into industry and, and being involved in that and, and seeing how they get on and stuff like that, as opposed to being just an academic, which I've always been. So I think it's going to be exciting. If you don't mind me asking, how how will that look? You mentioned that 50% of your time will be uh, on on this collaboration, but uh, will there be, are you going on site or is there a team at AstraZeneca who's going to be working with you on this? Yeah, there's a couple of teams there. So, um, I guess one of the, the one of the things about working with a, a company. So I've had strong links with AstraZeneca for a number of years. Um, a good collaborator of mine is a guy called Mark Wigglesworth, who's, but he's based up at Macclesfield and Manchester site. And of course, AstraZeneca have invested very heavily in, in Cambridge, um, where their headquarters is going to be. Um, and it's been nice to start to develop interactions with other teams beyond just the high throughput screening team here. Um, so one of those is the genome editing team. And, and, and part of the fellowship is to say, well, I know what we're good at, um, but I know what we can't do. And it's learning those sorts of, of techniques. So um, they also have another compound screening based unit here from, from the old Medimune company, which went um, and they remerged again. Um, yeah. So we're, I'm going to sort of span across the two teams to try to because companies don't necessarily know what's going on between different bits of it which i find quite fascinating so i'm going to span across the two of them um we already have a phd student in the lab who works with the the, the screening compound group anyway um so he's going to assist me with, with some of the stuff and actually i might even end up doing some experiments myself which would be quite exciting because i haven't done that in a very long time. I think my, my group are panicking that I might end up back in the lab again. <laughs> so I, th I think what we'll do is spend, I mean, COVID permitting one or, one or two days a week actually on site within AstraZeneca. Um, and that will be coming easier once they've finished their, their move into the new building. Oh, that's, that sounds like a really, really great experience for you and as well for, for your PhD student. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, well, he might not think it when he, when I'm giving him experiments to do it, I can't get to work, but then we'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> but still, I think, I think, you know, I feel like whenever you're doing a PhD or you're doing a postdoc, when you're deep into the weeds, you don't realize the, the, the advantages that you have. Once you're done and then you look back, you say, actually, it wasn't, it was great. I learned a lot yeah. from, from successes and failures as well. It's, it's also going to be quite interesting. I don't know if I should really say this, but um, having been, you know, my training being a yeast person and working on yeast and, and working on pheromone receptors, um, it might be surprising, but I can't actually do the techniques that my lab do now. You know, the bread based things that I've talked about, yeah. I've never grown mammalian tissue culture. I've not done any of that sort of stuff. So it's it will be quite interesting to perhaps learn how to do that at, at a bit older age than when I was first doing it. <laughs> But I think that's uh, that, that's great, and it. Oops, I think you you um you froze for a bit. I have challenge as well. You froze just there for a little bit, and I think the last sentence I heard was that you're excited to be to be learning how to do tissue culture with mammalian mammalian cells. Yeah, so I just think it's going to be very interesting to perhaps teach teach an old dog new tricks i think that would be the, be the <laughs> phrase to use <laughs> I mean, not just don't sneeze on the cells and you should be good <laughs> no, i see people with gloves on and things like that and we never used to do that we never had to worry about that with yeast so it was always fun <laughs> yeah well i've never worked with yeast i'd always worked with mammalian cells and i think that it's it's at some point you get to it there i think it's a beautiful system you know, yes, hex cells don't give us all the answers we want, and then going into more physiologically relevant systems is important. But hex cells or any other, you know, um, cell lines, but I, th I think mostly hex cells, just because of how easy they are to detach and at the same time to to passage, they're just 
such a, I, I don't know. It's it's me looking in the morning in the microscope and seeing how they're, they're beautifully shaped and then they reflect the light the right way. So you can tell that I've spent a lot of time looking at Hexels. Yeah, I think but, you've got a Hexel loving going on there, I think. Yeah, I, I do. And, and I'm also I'm Brett biased as well because I think it's just an easy to go to and an, sometimes not so easy to interpret. Um, data but i think it's just a beautiful and it's a simple technology yeah that, i think you know yeah yeah i know we're very happy to invest in it that's fantastic so um the other question i had for you is some of the challenges that you think should be addressed to facilitate understanding the function of either one of those class b receptors or any of the receptors that, that you're working on i think the challenge is always going to be trying to develop small molecule agonists to these receptors. Um, and, you know, I think perhaps people wouldn't agree, but I think GLP-1 leads the way in, in that front. I think that's obviously from its role in type 2 diabetes um, and people looking at that. So I think if we could reach that point where we can get some really good small molecule agonists to these receptors, I think once we start getting a few, then I think that's going to open up the opportunity for other receptors along. Along the lines, and I know, you know, years ago companies tried and were not very successful. Whereas I think now, it, it's probably going to happen sooner rather than later, and I and I think that's going to be quite exciting. Um, you know, there are a few out for GLP one already, so you know, once you start getting a few, then it's going to get much much, much cleaner. Um, I guess the thing I find a little bit sad is that if you try and do any search along the family, um, and and you try you type in glucagon. After all you ever seem to get is GLP-1 receptor. So I feel a little bit sorry for the glucagon receptor. It seems to be the forgotten person in the, or the forgotten receptor in the family. But um, again, I think we'll, we'll start to get some more molecules towards glucagon receptor as well. So, so I think that's where, where I think it's got to go. And, and I think that will happen now. And those small molecules would be as used as tool molecules to better understand receptor function, or would you envision those small molecules to become drugs? Both, I think. Um, you know, I, I think certainly the, the driver is going to be GLP one, I think, to, to make them for drugs, isn't it? Um, yeah. But equally, I think once you start to get them as, as tool compounds as well, then they're going to really help in, in both ways as well. So, so both is what I would suggest on that. Would you Would you be able to envision uh, peptide, small peptide as peptides as drugs or novel peptides? I it's it's a difficult and it's a more complicated yeah task. And, and people are, people are trying that aren't they you know five six seven amino acid peptides i think they're trying that as well um yeah. i think you have to yeah yes I, I think all of those sorts of options anything that's better than working on a 40 50 amino acid peptide it's, it's gonna yes. make life a little bit easier as well and of course you you, you know the, the driver as well for patients is that the, the lack of wanting to inject i think people are not so keen on injecting and things like that it's much easier if you could if you can take a tablet or a pill or something along those lines for them um you know my, my own mom was um, a type 2 diabetic and she wasn't really that keen on doing the old insulin injections and, and stuff like that um, i would say that that's not the reason i got involved in looking at GLP-1 or stuff because of her mm -hmm. diabetes that, that came afterwards but um but it sort of did make you realize as a sci basic scientist some of the the compliance things that the patients have to go through when they're injecting things as well. So, so I think yeah, orally available small molecules to to class B GPCRs would be amazing. Whether whether that will happen yet, I don't know. But the more tool compounds that come out, then you, you think it's going yeah. to, along the line it's going to happen. I love it, and then I think working with with peptides can become very expensive as well. You mentioned the five kilograms of, <laughs> of GLP-1. And then the whole hassle of working with peptides, you know, they precipitate, you've, you know, keeping yes, them in DMSO yeah. might not be the best yeah. way and cells don't like that for sure. So and how well they line tips and things like that, if you're not careful and, and yes. like that, what your concentrations are and things such as yes. that we are actually putting in. And if you've worked on the PGH, then you know exactly the yes. that are involved in <laughs> Um, not, not I do think they, 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 while they're expensive to work on, they do provide some easier rationales, I think, sometimes for the, for the bias aspects of things, because you can sort of think, well, is that, you know, class B's always have a, 
and the C-terminus binding and then the insertion. Yeah. Um, so you think, well, actually, I don't need to necessarily worry about part of that molecule potentially for, for the agonist side of it. There's other bits that yeah. I can focus on. So I, I think the rational, some rationale for which bits are doing what can be easier to follow. Mm-hmm. It then just becomes very expensive to make um, and also impossible to make every combination of every amino acid. I think we worked, worked it out one of the peptides that we worked on and it was about something like a third of the weight of the moon or something if you wanted to get a milligram of them or because of the sheer wow. numbers of you know, what is it, 25, 26 to the 20 or something along those lines. So yeah, it becomes quite quite a challenge. So no one's going to do that. Wow, that's still, it's it's a lot. It's a lot of, yeah, it's difficult to work with peptides. And I do agree with the fact that it's more of a, it's, it's easy. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I don't want to use the word or the term easier, but it, uh, I, I'd say it's more natural because it's it looks more similar to the uh, natural binder. Yeah, but yeah. It, it's it's not without its its challenges. No, absolutely. So you mentioned um, you mentioned that having a structure of these receptors is really helpful in understanding what they look like, and obviously, a structure is a snapshot in time. What are the some of the other tools that you think we should we would need if you had a magic wand and you could manifest new tools, better tools to understand and speed up understanding the function and hopefully you know coming up with molecules faster against the well, to bind these receptors? What would that? Be when I saw your question, what key information are we missing that would help speed up drug discovery? I thought, well, if I'd had the answer to that, I'd be sitting in a nice beach in the Caribbean with a rum, <laughs> a multi-millionaire and not worrying about it, and as opposed to being a, an academic <laughs> doing things. And I, 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 I'm really taken with the trying to bridge those snapshots that you were talking about between the different yeah. things. And I think some of the, the work where people are using molecular dynamic simulations, I think is, is super cool in, in trying to bridge that. And I think the more we can work on that sort of approaches um, and try to develop those better then i think that should help us along the lines of drug discovery and just to simply make it key that we can then work out what key interactions are required for those kinds of processes and of course the technology is getting more and more where you can include the g protein in that the full g protein complex as we get more structures of those we get to see what's going on so i think trying to have that entire model and the dynamics of that process and meeting those transition stages is is, is really going to be part of what, what the process is required for doing that. Of course, you know, from our modeling stuff as well, um, you always have to validate your models as well. So models are only ever a prediction. So getting that validation is critical as well. I love it. Well, I was talking to uh, to Anthony Bucard, who is down in Mexico, and not working on, on peptide GPCRs, he's working on adhesion GPCRs. And when I asked him this question about the tools, and I said, you had a magic wand, and what would you like to do? And he said he would love to have a tiny camera to actually photograph these states of these receptors. And I thought it was such a great, um, mm. great idea. And I said, people would now are paying thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars to get away from Earth and take a look at down at Earth and us as biochemists, scientists, we want to go down deeper into, <laughs> into the yeah, cell. Yeah, yeah. So, so I guess taking those snapshots and having those, those structures with different, you know, G proteins, but also complexes is really us having those, ca- that camera. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a really good analogy. Um, I'm, not, I'm not quite good at those analogies. I, I almost did a, um, one of these STEM events, you know, where you talk to the younger children um, and I actually mm-hmm. had a, talking about drilling down and I did a microscope which was looking down into a really fine detail and also a picture from the Hubble Space Telescope which is going the other way and yeah, you see that the structures look very similar when you get down to those different levels um, yeah. so yeah just going the opposite way so yeah so I do ask this from everyone and I think the answer to that is yes but do you think GPCRs are still good drug targets and I guess my question is why or how should we I think, think about I think, drug GPCRs? So yes, they are but still good drug targets. And I think one of the things is that we spend a lot of time um, saying that, you know, FDA drugs, lots of drug sales to these receptors, there's lots of money is made from these receptors. And, but actually when you drill that down, I think it's only made from a very small amount of actual receptors that are contributing to that. So that means that there's a whole bulk of other receptors 
which we're not targeting. And, and I think one of the, the challenges that we need to consider is, well, why are we not targeting those receptors? Adenosine receptors is, is an example. The adenosine A1, we know it's a really good analgesic um, potential thing, but we know it also has, well, you have to be careful in the phrase, it has unwanted on-target effects because of the cardiovascular complications and things such as that. So it's trying to, can we bring those receptors into the fold as, as now drug targets by our understanding of the molecular pharmacology of them, their tissue expression? What is it that means it works in one tissue and maybe not in another? Could we develop to that tissue? For instance, could we go for the pain aspect, but not some of the cardiovascular complications and things such as that? So, so yes, they are good. So they still a great drug target, but it would be good to get some of these other bulk of these receptors. And there are not many on orphaned receptors or non-deorphanized receptors left now. So we know quite a lot of them. It would be really cool to see if we can bring some of those into, into the mainstream in, in drug design. I think I think so too. I, and I love the idea of, you know, I love the fact that you mentioned that right now, yes, there are drugs. And I think this is everyone's slide whenever they're presented about GPCRs that about 30 to 50% of FDA approved drugs target GPCRs. But I also think this is the low hanging fruit. Yeah. And I sometimes think that, well, so I, when I think about it, these molecules, they were not developed to target GPCRs. It just so happens that they do target GPCRs. Yeah. And, and seeing a reversal in the way we do drug discovery and specifically target GPCRs, as you mentioned, in a specific tissue, in a specific disease state, I think that's, that's, that's no, no longer low hanging fruit and that's the next step yeah, yeah, no, I would, I would agree with you on that. Um, and it is fascinating to see how many of the receptors are actually targeted farm, you know, with, with approved drugs and things that this is both big bulk of them. And I don't include, include the olfactory ones in that. I think you just leave those aside yeah. for a moment. But there is a bulk of these receptors which are just not targeted. Yeah, and I think, well, that's, that's the beauty and the difficulty of the GPCR fields is that these receptors can do many things and it's on us scientists, or me not anymore because I'm not working in the lab, but really kind of um, really figuring out which receptor combination with what effectors, what signaling pathway, and what tissue causes the disease or has an effect on the disease. And that that's the one we need to target. And I think that's the difficulty here. Yeah, I, I completely agree. We, uh, we have a phrase, we said the GPCRs in the family that continue to give. Um, and I think that's true because uh, once you start to think you understand them and you don't, and they have to start again. Um, and, you know, I get said to a lot of people, I say, people still working on GPCR. Surely that is all being sorted out now. And like, nah, I think it's getting, the more we know, the more complicated I think it gets. But... Agreed, agreed. And I feel like, it, you know, better understanding GPCRs takes many dis disciplines, takes a lot of collaboration. Yes, you need to do your bread experiments with the hex cells, but at the same time, going into native tissue, going into animal models, and, and so on, it's, and, and having structures as well, are all of these key elements that go into that same bucket in order to hopefully understand one GPCR or one family. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Just one receptor would be nice to understand. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> yes, and hopefully hopefully draw some conclusions out of that one and in order to try to see if it's applicable to others. Yeah. And I love love the idea of working, you know, on, on class class B GPCRs, those few. It's funny because you think about it and you say, oh, there's only 15, but those only 15 do so many different things and we still don't understand everything that they do. Completely agree. <laughs> Completely agree. As long as it keeps me going until I'm retired and it's all right. <laughs> I think I, I think it will, and I think it's going to keep a lot of PhDs and, and PhD students and, and postdocs busy for for many decades to come. Yeah, I agree. Speaking of of trainees, what would be your advice to to young scientists aspiring to contribute to the field? Yeah, I spent a bit of time thinking about that one. Um, I think one of the things is to follow your dream. Um, as I said earlier on, you know, I. I didn't know. I think the information is more available now, perhaps, than it was when I was at school and things. I didn't realize that you could do this as a career, um, and it is a very rewarding career. Um, and coming from my background, you know, obviously, I was the first person to go to university, so that meant that I didn't go out 16, I didn't go and get a job. So I had quite a lot of 
people saying to me and my parents, well, when's he going to get a real job? Um, he's still at his, um, my, bless her, my dear nan, even when um, I was at university, she still thought I was being kept, she used to tell her friends I'd been kept back at school. Um, but yeah, which was a bit, it, it hurt a bit. Um, but I was determined to follow my dream and do what I do. Um, and I guess that's the other word in it, to be determined. So don't back down when people tell you that it's not something you should do. Um, it, it's what I, I was very fortunate. My, my parents supported me in doing what I wanted to do. Um, and those, so those would be the things I would say, follow your dream and be determined. I, I've been lucky to work at, at good institutes, but, you know, every time we've moved, you've, we've had to step up and, and, and try to push ourselves further on. And I think I'm quite a determined person. So I think having determination and, and, and following your dreams, what, what you should do. I love it. And then you mentioned at the very beginning that you wanted to move away from your from your from where you were born and where you lived. And that's why you went to Birmingham. Yeah. Um, and what I wanted to ask regarding that is uh, how, and you mentioned that there was a big contrast between between those two places how was it in the beginning were you afraid and how did you adapt I think that's important. I, was, I was very naive <laughs> I didn't understand what it like to live in a big city having come from a small area um, and obviously when you go to university in the first year in Birmingham we were we were put in halls of residence so it was kind of a bit insular but you, you started to learn more about going out and, and stuff like that but then in the second year we were um, just in a house as a group of us, and, and I, I learned a lot compared to what it was like living in a in a, a small town. Um, I don't think there's any getting away from that. Um, was I scared? I think you're always a scare when you leave home for the first time. Um, but equally, I think my parents were very understanding as well that once I'd made that transition and I wanted to go off and do this, that there wasn't really much hope of me ever going back to my hometown. Was the area we've ended up back in the area in Cambridge, but actually back in my hometown it doesn't have a university, it doesn't have much research and stone science or anything like that. So it was clear that if I was going to follow my dream, I needed to move. So I again, I think following my dream and, and being determined, I wanted to do that as early as I could. If that makes sense. It does. It does. The reason I was asking this is because sometimes uh, you you made multiple great points. So let me try and and take them apart. So point number one, yes, followed your dreams and the fact that, you know, you went out of your comfort zone. And that's not easy to do. I don't know if you're familiar with this. There's the for a long time, there was this cartoon on Facebook when there were these two circles. And it was the one circle when it says your comfort zone and the second circle, which was outside of the comfort zone and then where the magic happens. And I think I, I think you you have to get out of that comfort zone. Yeah. Whether it's moving away from your family and starting out in a new city or whether it's taking a next step in your career and deciding that you want to do a postdoc or you want to be a professor or you don't want to be a professor. And yeah. I think that's that's a super important point. And it is always scary. And un unfortunately, quote unquote, sometimes people look at you know at accomplished people and they only see what they have accomplished, but they don't see all the difficulties they went through. No, I, I totally agree on that. Um, and, and we're not very good as uh, we, the scientists, we only ever show what works and we only ever show the good side of things, but actually, you know, the, the harder side of it is just if you have a family and, and that trying to balance that um, work-life balance, especially out of the, the past two years have been yeah. even more difficult to, to try to find that, that distinction yeah. as well. So. So you're totally right about that. Um, it, it, people don't see what goes on behind the scenes. Exactly. And then you did it. You, you went from a small town to university and then you moved from town to town. And you mentioned that sometimes your family wasn't um, really happy at the idea of, of moving again. But then I think moving develops your character. And it's is difficult, it is challenging, it is scary, but once you've done it and you look back, you can actually be proud of yourself for making that decision. Yeah, I completely agree with you on that one. Um, I wasn't popular when I was given uh, the opportunity to move to Cambridge with my, my obviously my, my wife and my, my children, because they were very happy where we were living. Um, 
but I knew that I had to do something to try to re reinvent myself and, and to try to reinvigorate myself in that process as well. So otherwise I think I would have gone stale and stuff and I need a level of keeping myself interested and I guess that's back to determination again. I like to push through and be determined to do something. I think the mathematical modeling is a, is a good example of that. I didn't understand the modeling, so I had to teach myself how to do it. And I like those kinds of challenges. So I, I like to continuously challenge myself. And, and the move was, was a challenge. Moving to Cambridge is scary. It is scary because of it being Cambridge. And, and that's what I mean about the determination. I, I was determined to make it a success when we moved to Cambridge. Um, I couldn't not make it a success because I didn't want to move my family for, for it all to go wrong. So again, I think determination really can carry me forward. I was never the best at school. I was never the best in all these things, but actually just being determined and pushing yourself, you can then move and move and move higher and higher, I think. I love it. I love it. I was, I think it was in a movie that I watched recently, or it was an interview and this person was mentioning that, um, you know, I think she was saying something along the lines of that she's always hard on herself and she that pushes her to go to the next step. And I really like like the idea being hard on yourself. I think I don't like the expression being hard on yourself, but I think uh, having a standard yeah. for yourself and always yeah. going above and beyond that standard. And I think I think we as scientists, we're very good at going from dopamine rush to dopamine rush. But the problem is that the timing between those two dopamine rushes <laughs> is, is long because 90% yeah. of the experiments we do are trash. Yeah. Or we get a rejected grant or rejected paper. Or yes. yeah, we had some yes. comments this morning which were a bit unkind on the paper and things like that. And, and it's a, I think actually it's quite important. And, and I think, again, over the past couple of years, it's been really important to, to celebrate success when we have had some successes. Um, it's not... It's not been as easy to do that, but I think we we tend to get numb to that sort of thing, and we only ever see the the bad side of things, the rejections and things such as that. Whereas it is it is actually still important to to celebrate when you actually do have some successes or when you, you make some impact. Um, and we've we've been trying very hard to get that back organised again as a, as a research team. How do you typically celebrate a success? Multiple ways. Um, usually, it involves some form of alcoholic drink. I would imagine somewhere along the lines. So those of us who, who can, um, can can partake in that, not everybody obviously takes a drink. Um, so, uh, but the social aspect of that as well, I think, which is the thing that has been missing um, in in the yeah. past couple of years of that. So, um, just having the the ability to go out and just have some time away from work um, and just enjoy each other's company, um, it is how I think you celebrate success. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much for that. Um, well, the aha questions we've already talked about. Any additional aha that uh, you you would have for us? Any wisdom? I think. I think moving. I think really like making the decision that where I was wasn't good for me, um, and actually having to to make that decision that I wanted to to move. Um, you can't just suddenly up sticks and move. You obviously have to have an opportunity to do that, um, and I think you also have to realize perhaps two to three years prior to, to putting yourself into that position that that's what your plan is you can't just um as i say you can't just stop sticks and put it all in a van and move you have to say well what am what am i going to do to get it so that i become more attractive to other places what is going to make make that i can do that so so making that moment and having that decision that actually i have to move um was an aha moment because you because it, it was about where do we go next? Do we spend the next 25 years just doing what we're doing or do we want to try to do something different? Um, and getting back to talking to people and meeting with people. So um, I don't want to bad mouth where I was, was before, but it was it was important to make that decision and make that decision clear in my mind at a point where I then had enough time to put myself to be able to do that. Um, it's not one you can just do in a month and say, well, I'm going to move. You need to know what you're going to do and have things in place. So, so make it, so, so that would be the, the third aha moment, I suspect. We have. Which is also a great, great advice for young scientists in the field because it goes back to planning out your career. It goes back to figuring out what is it that you like, what do you want, and where you want to be. Yeah, it's, I'm it's not a, a, a one. I've never been a very good... Um, 
some people say I'm a bit spontaneous, but I'm not a great spontaneous person. I need to have a plan. Um, you know, my, my diary for today is planned because <laughs> I knew I was doing this and everything. But you have to have a plan. Um, and I think that was what that was for me. I, I knew that I had to have an end goal of where I wanted to go. So that moment and just making that decision that you're going to do that. I guess it's the same as when, when I initially when I left um, my hometown to, to move somewhere else. It was like, OK, I'm going to do this. And that's what that happened to me. Um, Took a little bit more to convince the family that that was a good move, but there we are. Um, now they wouldn't swap it for the world. But at the time, it was more of a job. That's fantastic. And I, th I think planning is important. In some, sometimes the plan goes out the window because it's out of your control. But um, focusing on what you can control is, is just the best way of, of going about things. Completely. All right. Completely. Last but not least, uh, if and when you have job openings, um, in your lab, where can people find you? You um, so usually on my website, so um, through the through the university, we'll put any opportunities there. Um, most of the time, we have PhD studentships advertised on there, and then if we are lucky enough to have postdocs available, then we probably use the jobs.ac.uk um, system as well for, for adverts and things. So you, you would find them on there. That's fantastic. And uh, these websites are going, well, including your lab's website, is going to be on our website when the podcast episode is released. And as you most likely know, um, we do have a career page where there is a small form to fill out, takes a few minutes, and we're happy to advertise any positions that you might have in your lab. Brilliant. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Graham, for your time. I really enjoyed talking to you today. It's been, it's been fun. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us and listening to this podcast episode. We'd like to thank our guest as well as our team members, Attila Forrest and Ines Pinero. Please make sure that you subscribe to the Dr. GPCR newsletter, find us on YouTube, and if you like our podcast, please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcast. You can also leave us a testimonial at drgpcr.com slash testimonials. Another great way to support us is to share your favorite Dr. GPCR program with your network and colleagues. Don't forget to check out and register for the Dr. GPCR ecosystem at drgpcr.com ecosystem. Email us with any questions or suggestions at hello at drgpcr.com. Until next time, stay safe.